What's up, everybody? JJ Worthen here, class of 2006. Big hello to all my fellow Huskies. Good to see you guys, and thanks for joining us today. Glad to be on this with uh, Jerry. Jerry, thanks for having me. Uh, maybe it would make sense for me to just start and introduce myself. Class of 2006, I said, music theory and composition major back when we did. Do we still do double majors, Jerry? <laughs> yes. Thing? Okay, good. Well, in any case, double major in theory comp. I'm currently uh, work for Microsoft uh, during the week and lead worship at the Woodway campus uh, for Second Baptist at the 11 o'clock service. Rock and roll service. So come and hang with us. Uh, very fun. Uh, but in any case, I've been there uh, for a number of years and I've been at Microsoft for about a year and a half. And let me see here, Jerry, um, live out in Cypress, Texas. So, you know, we got to endure this magical winter wonderland just a few weeks ago, and now it's beautiful summer outside. So uh, weird weather in Texas, but that's probably nothing new. Uh, we live out here in Cyprus. I've got um, my wife's name is Jessica, not an HBU grad. She went to U of H, but won't hold that against her. I uh, have two amazing kids, an almost six-year-old girl and an almost four-year-old boy who just learned to ride his bike without training wheels. And I'm super pumped, very excited for him um, because, you know, the world is his oyster now. Mm -hmm. So let me see. Spare time. I spend a lot of time cycling with uh, a few fellow Huskies, Matt Lockhart being or my, my main ride or die right now, uh, quite literal ride or die on the cycle, but spent a lot of time cycling, a lot of time uh, playing music. Got uh, uh, just a parlor of guitars, you know, pastel guitars right here next to me and amps behind me that you can't see in my virtual Microsoft studio that I'm standing in live from Cypress, Texas. But in any case, maybe there's more interesting things about me, but that's what's going on right now. And I'm glad to be here. So thanks for having me, Jerry. JJ, it's really cool to have you here. And I mean, you work at Microsoft, but you have this passion for worship. So obviously, you know, you, you're in both worlds. You're in the real world. Um, sometimes the ministry world can be a bit of a waiting lobby to, to what the main thoroughfare of life is like. Tell us what it's like being in both worlds. Yeah, it's actually a lot of similarities, you know, in certain respects. Um, and the thing that, that I really love about being in both worlds is what I get to do at Microsoft and at Second are both very highly creative jobs, you know, I would say. Um, at Second, even though the creativity tends to look more like we typically think of creative, you know, roles and arts and crafts and colors uh, and paints and music and sounds and the EQ side of, of work. And when you think of a tech company like Microsoft, you typically think IQ side of work. Uh, but what I do with, with customers is I actually help them create plans for transformation. And so that doesn't sound anything remotely like what you do in worship, but in worship, we create you know, uh, environments for people that you know, ultimately uh, God uses to help transform each one of us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same thing that I do in my day-to-day -day job at Microsoft is I, I help create environments and engagements for customers as they go through business transformation. But some of the things that we focus on typically in ministry or in church or worship are focused on, you know, kind of helping create environments where people can be transformed personally. That's cool. So JJ Worthen is, uh, you were a music theory composition major at HBU and now at Microsoft. So help me, because during the pandemic, it was interesting to me, the companies that got a bounce and those who didn't. And, you know, life as we know is never really going to be normal as it was, quote unquote, pre-pandemic. Yeah. I mean, the dial got moved. And I think it's why Airbnb is valued more than the Marriott Corporation right now. I mean, we yeah. could probably apply that to a bunch of different areas of life or business. But what kind of transformational experiences, and, and take me inside the cockpit of Microsoft, what you observed during these unique and tumultuous days? Yeah. Well, you know, grief and catastrophe tend to be the great equalizers, you know, as you know. And even from what we're doing right now, you know, remote podcasting and remote meetings, this was something that was typically and I guess initially reserved for tech companies and the most forward thinking companies, if you want to look at it that way. But then everybody was forced to adopt this, 
So usually kind of when you look at a transformation curve, it's, it's more like a, a, a bell curve, right? And you've got your first and early adopters. And then there's just kind of this gradual change as everyone starts to adopt specific types of, you know, thoughts, uh, or sorry, uh, mindsets and or, you know, technologies, things like remote meetings. Well, with the pandemic, it was, it, it wasn't like a, a bell curve. It was a straight, it wasn't a sine wave. It was a square wave. It was just boom. We all have to, to change right now. So what I've seen with a lot of the customers that I work with and what we're seeing at Microsoft is everybody had to take a step back and say, we're never going back. What does it mean to do business digitally now? And for many companies, they haven't thought that the, the impetus was important as it was with COVID. You know, it kind of forced everybody's hand to evolve and embrace kind of digital business and things like remote meetings, remote selling, you know, remote work just in a different capacity than I think we've ever done before. And the transformational experiences, can you just kind of let us in on a little more detail of what occupies you Monday through Friday with Microsoft? Sure. Yeah. So I'm in the business applications group. And that means I work with sales leaders and marketing leaders and leaders who are looking to build uh, specific platforms using no code technology. So very simply, as I help align the right solutions in our business applications group to help maybe a VP of sales or a VP of marketing or a chief operations officer or the CIO. So I um, specialize in a group of applications to help enable those different parts of a business. Very cool. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in an entrepreneurial kind of DNA city and nobody is more entrepreneurial uh, that I've been found than Robert Sloan, and particularly when it comes to teaching. I mean, he'll mm -hmm. turn and make decisions quickly. And back in 1415, Dr. Sloan really led a dramatic expansion of HBU online. And we went from just kind of like many schools doing online in a what I'd call a beta test to now we're on our way to 2000 students online. HBU now scatters to nearly 50 states and, and it is growing dramatically. How important do you think it is? I mean, thinking about the world that you know from Microsoft Vantage Point, that HBU is now providing an educational experience digitally as well as residentially. I think it's an amazing approach. And I think that we have to to grow and adopt and move more things online just for the just for the sheer reach and and enabling access uh, for students because you know the thing that happened with with YouTube and if you want to even go further back in LimeWire and Kazaa and Napster and kind of the uh, the proliferation of, of music content is it lowered the barrier for entry significantly and it made everything available to everyone at any moment and any day right. And so if you think about how that transformed, if we just want to talk about music, you know, that transformed the recording industry because you went from, I only have 24 hours in a day to trend, uh, stream content um, through, you know, traditional radio channels. Now I can listen to music anywhere at any time and I can listen to any artist and I don't have to buy the whole record. I don't even have to buy the record at all. I can just license it by the month and listen to as much as I possibly can. I don't have to do that on the radio, you know, so there's, the content proliferation started a while back and really changed the way that we consume. And if you think about YouTube now, I think the last dated statistic from the end of 2019 is I think there's somewhere around 500 hours of content uploaded per minute. Mm -hmm. You know, just it's really overwhelming what goes online. So all that to say is we've all shifted our attention and our appetite from being in-person learners and consumers to being consumers of viral content everywhere. So I think it's amazing that we're choosing to address our students and, you know, learners, not only in the in-classroom setting, but also in the digital setting as well, because we've all kind of adapted and shifted every other way that we learn to that method as well. Talk to us for a minute about your experience at HBU. I mean, what drew you there? Music theory, composition major, um, you know, you're now in one of America's, you know, premier churches, Second Houston, a, a long relationship with with Dr. Young, wonderful, wonderful, innovative. I remember years ago, the Wall Street Journal was doing articles on second and um, taking notice. 
what was the experience like at HBU in what you your your major, and then how have you transformed that into an avant garde eleven eleven worship service? Sure. Well, I looked at U of H and I looked at HBU because I had family that went to U of H, and there was something about HBU because you know Bob Powell, who was on the board uh, of trustees, you know he you know, helped advocate. But then when I went to the school and took a tour, I was like, I just fell in love with it. And I was working with Dr. Yarrington. He's the one that, that recruited me and have, you know, just a world of respect for me's family. And just, I don't know, there was just something really amazing about what was going on at HBU and the music program. that I was like, I just, I have to be here, you know? And then there was something about Dr. Y saying, hey, I want you here. I'm going to advocate that you get here. I'll do anything that I can to help you. There was something about just the interaction that I had with the faculty and, and uh, people like Dr. Y, Dr. Kramlick, Dr. Gabor, Dr. Fur, you know, John Hendrickson, God rest his soul. You know, a lot of these people that just made a permanent mark on me and they made me feel like I belong there even though my imposter syndrome was flaring up wildly. Um, you know, amazing talent like this. So that's kind of what drew me there. And I'll tell you, I, I started as a, you know, as a vocal performance major. And then I thought, you know, I like singing, but I really love playing. And my voice happens to be an instrument that I play. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to learn how to kind of speak languages across a lot of instruments. So I switched to theory comp to kind of get into the, how does it work? You know, the architect side of my brain. And from that moment on it, you know, I just, I got into a lot of different things. And I would say how I use that at second and, and, I guess how that comes into play is I'm mainly at the 11 o'clock service to lead and sing and, and play either guitar, or play piano, but I'll also step into some of the other services when they need a pinch hitter. Uh, mm -hmm. I just tell them, hey, I'm, I'm fat kid at prom, you know, I'm just happy I got an invite. So whatever you need, I'm here to help. <laughs> so what it looks like is, is I'm, uh, if you've been to any of the Christmas shows in prior years, you know, it looks like me singing a, an opera piece at a second and then singing a pop piece and then playing I got a hot pink guitar in here you know playing that and then doing a vocoder thing and wearing leather pants I don't know maybe I said too much about the Christmas program <laughs> but <laughs> in any case I, I, I love that I'm able to put all the stuff you know that I can't all if you use the parable of the talents I can just kind of put whatever I have in my skill set and say here use it and there's a place at second for me to put that into use which I really appreciate you know, the diversity you have, JJ, is very unique. And, and as we all know, there are many people who get enthusiastic about a certain message or worship style, and there's none other in existence but the one they're enthusiastic about. But we both know that people are drawn different to music styles, but it's a unique reality, uh, uh, gift mix you have that you can kind of move from an 1111 to a conservative or to an operatic. I mean, that technical training at HBU, and if there's anything I know about HBU, whatever you apply in, they're going to train you in it. You're not going to get one of those fake kind of cheapy degrees that yeah. the professor turned his head and just gave A's. I mean, how was that training helpful now for your diversification musically? Oh, my goodness. Invaluable, let me tell you. I actually spoke to the School of Music a few days ago, and um, I kind of highlighted some of the things that I've done in my music career. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that I've sung in 10 to 15, 10 to 15 different languages, you know, been on a, a few different TV shows, had songs on the radio, on commercials. Um, and I want to say that maybe I've toured 15, 20 countries. Mm -hmm. So you know, if I could give you one situation where I feel like this, maybe this is the anomaly, but this is where my training was just absolutely crucial. I was working um, at Sugar Hill Studios here in town, a really amazing facility, and they, they just had a lot of uh, great acts and a lot of uh, music come out of there. But there's an artist named Kareem Salama who was working with Dan Workman, and, and both of these guys are both longtime friends of mine now. But Kareem essentially said, hey, Dan, I'm going on a tour going to go through the Middle East and I need a guy or a girl. I just need somebody, you know, who can sing and who can play and they can also kind of MD, but I need them to be able to sing in Arabic and I need them to have some knowledge of like Ableton and live production and I also need them to be able to play the guitar or like be a multi-instrumentalist, right? They need to play a keys thing on here. They need to, 
And Dan just said, I, I know about maybe one or two people that do that. And, you know, one, the first guy that comes to mind is JJ. So call him. So anyway, it, it, it was a, obviously that's kind of an anomaly, but that's one of those things where I felt like my training helped set me up for success because I felt comfortable kind of getting around different musical styles and kind of speaking different languages, musical and verbal, you know, and I felt, I felt okay about it. I felt excited to, to go jump in. I felt like I was prepared enough, you know, and that I had the, the right tools to go meet the needs. So that's just one story, but I'm very, very thankful that, you know, of what I learned at HBU, I, I felt like I got the right skill set to go succeed, you know. So cool. You know, depending on how you interpret that passage in Ezekiel about Lucifer, the morning star, I mean, some scholars take that passage and they, they interpret it that Lucifer in the beginning before he fell was music in and of himself, you know, some kind of angelic being that was like a thousand perfectly coordinated orchestras. And we know that he led all the angels of God before he fell in worship to God. Um, both of us have seen both the positive and incredible impact of music and I think both of us have probably seen music used in a whole different way, um, where it, it just has different values, it has a different result. Um, why, what is it that's so powerful about worship in all of its different genres? And what would your comment be on that passage and then on the church today in this post-pandemic world where everybody feels like they've been beaten up and many have you know, the big takeaway of COVID are those who lost people, you know, which I can't even get my head around my wife and I keep praying for all those people. But what's your thought, JJ, uh, in regard to the tool of worship and music that God has given in its original form? Mm. Well, it's kind of like a smile, you know, our facial expressions no matter what language you speak, some of these things just translate and we understand regardless of culture and how we identify and say, hi, I'm an American, I am a, an Egyptian, I am a, you insert the word, you know, and how we see ourselves. Music is something that even with no words, we can feel and understand. It's a great unifying language. It's something that we all get, I think. So when I think about the importance of worship, you know, in the church and just music in general, it should be with the purpose to unify, you know, it also does a number of other things, you know, when you think about grief, you know, music has a, an amazing ability to soothe us, to comfort us, or to help us to lean into something to make us feel in a way that we've never felt before, right? Um, so I think one of the most important actions we can have as a worship leader is to facilitate an environment that ushers in unity, you know? Um, and that's one of the most important things, I think, about music, you know, just across all time and across in instruments, languages spoken is all around unity. Totally agree. And, uh, you know, I often think about Paul's words, you know, to a Jew, I became a Jew to, to those without law, without law to a Gentile, I became a Gentile. It takes a really mm -hmm. mature Christian to kind of get it, that God uses different genres of music to connect, to edify, and to inspire different people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, you obviously are doing that in a beautiful way. J.J. Worthen is at Second Baptist Church on Woodway in Houston, the 11 o'clock worship service. You ought to experience that. You can learn more at second.org. And there is a place at HBU for you. Um, you know, we often hear the word family, JJ. If, if someone asked me in 200 plus podcasts, what has been the unsolicited word that has been repeatedly spoken trying to convey HBU to me? It's been interesting, but people have said it feels like a family. Now, can, can you comment on that? I mean, you've got buddies you're cycling with from your days. I mean, it's a lot of years since you were there. Yeah. You're still connected. You reeled off a bunch of names without hesitation. <laughs> but what kind of family connection was HBU for you? Oh, my goodness. So many, so many family connections. So I'll tell you, you know, it wasn't just students 
right? When I got to HBU, you know, um, I met a ton of people that I still stay in contact with today, met a lot of great lifelong friends, like I mentioned, like Matt. Um, but when you think about the faculty, I mean, when you go into school, you kind of think it's going to be an us and them type of situation, right? There's the faculty and there's the staff, and then there's me, you know, or the student body. And you typical, typically think of them, or at least I did, I thought it was just going to be kind of disconnected, quite the opposite. You know, uh, when I think of Dr. Y, Dr. Fur, um, you know, Dr. Cram, like any of these folks, I mean, when I see them, and I mean, Dr. Kramlick and I were talking just a couple of days ago, I was like, hey, let's go hit this golf course. We haven't played golf in a while. Um, when we were at campus and maybe I showed up unprepared to a class, not saying that I ever did that, but you know, if I did and I said, hey, just grab your seven iron, let's go play, let's go play campus golf. You know, let's just talk, let's catch up. You know, we had more than just an agenda of, hey, what did you learn lately? And are you ready for X and Y exam or, you know, we had actual uh, an actual uh, friendship and family connection that we still hold on to to this day. So um, amazing connection and totally agree. Family is the right word to say. It's an amazing place and unlike any other. You know, we both know, JJ, I mean, there's only so many houses and cars you can buy and steaks you can eat. And at the end of the day, <laughs> you kind of really reflect back on who's my friends, you know, who can yeah. I hang out with? Who can I be transparent with? Who can I call when I'm hurting? Yeah. JJ Worthen, you're, you're such a gift to the city of Houston and beyond, to Second, to the HBU family. We're so grateful for how God's using you and uh, for the light that emanates from your life. Uh, he, JJ is another reason why there is a place for you at HBU. Go to hbu.edu slash admissions a plethora of things to review or call 281-649-3211. And remember HBU grad, if the post pandemic is driving anything, it's the reality that 22 million people are looking for master's degrees online alone. Mm -hmm. We have an entire graduate school, hbu.edu slash grad or 281-649-3269. And our deepest gratitude to those who give 60 years ago, some men stood in what was a bunch of grass and a highway that didn't go beyond Fondren or barely even reached it. And they personally signed notes to make HBU happen. And here we are 60 years later, 22,000 graduates later. You can make the dream happen by giving at hbu.edu slash giving. JJ, thanks so much for being with us, man. We really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to talk to you and follow you in the future. Okay. Jerry, thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Blessings, my friend. Have a great day. Thank you. Same to you.